Hi everyone, I'm looking at my periodic table of chemical elements and thinking just how much work was required to obtain all these metals and shape them into such perfect cubes. Because only a small number of all these metals occur naturally in their pure form, and the rest of the metals occur only in the form of compounds. Hmm, let me try to extract some metal from its compound and make something unusual from it, for instance a knife. Do you think I will succeed? Let's find out. As you and I know, in this world there are many secrets of the origin of matter, physics and other mysteries that only mathematics can open. Well, to understand mathematics, you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winner, it's enough to have the right tools and a convenient service at hand that will help solve almost any mathematical puzzle. Brilliant is a very tool with which you will open the door for yourself in solving any problems, and it is a website and an application with more than 60 interactive courses in mathematics and natural science sciences and computer science. You'll start with the simplest tasks, the solution of which will not take much time, and you'll gradually increase your understanding for more complex algorithms, until you start clicking problems like nuts. Thanks to daily small tasks, you'll learn to think critically in order to analyze any problem from different sides and solve any mathematical puzzle like a scientist. Upgrade your analysis level to a pro. Change your life for the better now with Brilliant. Follow my link Brilliant slash Toy Story 2 and register for free. But hurry up, only the first 200 people will receive 20% discount on a premium subscription. Good luck! I came up with an idea to make some items from do-it-yourself metal after visiting the city of Kohn, located in the beautiful Italian Alps. There are old mines not far from this city, where up until 1979 iron ore, or to be more precise, magnetite was mined. By the way, Ivan managed to go on an excursion to those mines and feel the mysterious atmosphere of that place, where the hard-working miners of that time worked. In one of the mines, we were even allowed to collect some iron ore, which was scattered all over the place. But unfortunately, that magnetite nugget that I found was of very low quality, and was basically a piece of gangue, which was completely unfit for extracting iron. But still, at the very end of the excursion, we were shown magnetite ore nuggets of quite high quality, which were much heavier than regular stones because of containing a lot of iron oxide. By the way, magnetite is called this way for a reason. This mineral is strongly attracted to magnet, or it is magnet that is strongly attracted to this mineral. Of course, on leaving the mine, I bought a beautiful piece of high-quality magnetite ore for my future chemistry experiments. Having traveled 2000 kilometers, this piece of magnetite ended up in my laboratory, where I can use it to extract the metal, which is iron. But how can I do it? On an industrial scale, iron is extracted from magnetite in huge blast furnaces, which are loaded with a mixture of different iron oxides and coal, and after that, air is pumped through the sourced furnace with all its content. As a result, coal in the furnace starts oxidizing into carbon monoxide, which reduces the iron from its oxides. The obtained iron contains a lot of excess carbon and is called cast iron, which is poured out beneath the furnace. Cast iron itself is a very fragile and is fit only for casting some rather fragile items like frying pans. In order to obtain a harder steel from cast iron or iron purified from excess carbon, molten cast iron is mixed with iron oxides and as a result excess carbon as well as excess sulfur and phosphorus impurities burn out. After that steel is obtained, which is fit for making lots of useful things. However, I don't have blast furnace. Besides, the process of obtaining cast iron is rather complex and requires precise calculations and expensive equipment. That is why I am going to use a good old reaction called termite to extract iron from this stone. If some of you didn't know, the mixture for the termite reaction consists of only two basic components, namely ferric oxide and aluminum. I'm going to use ferric oxide for demonstration purposes, because it's the most frequently used chemical for making the termite mixture. However, 
other iron oxides can be used too. Then I'm adding aluminum powder to the mixture. Ideally, less fine aluminum powder should be used for the reaction, but I didn't have it at hand. In the end, in order to slow down the reaction and separate the freshly obtained iron from the impurities, I'm adding some flux to the mixture, which consists of calcium fluoride and cryolite, which is a natural mineral called sodium hexafluoroaluminate. Now, after stirring the mixture, we can try to obtain some iron in order to demonstrate the burning of the thermite mixture. It's best to run this reaction in flower pots made of fired clay, because they are cheap and can withstand sudden drops of temperature without cracking. First of all, I'm pouring in some regular sand into the flower pot, which will serve as a mold for the freshly obtained iron. To make it easier to separate the obtained iron nugget from its impurities and to prevent it from sticking to the sand, I'm pouring a mixture of zirconium oxide and pure silicon oxide into the pot, which can withstand the high temperature of the thermite reaction without melting. The thermite mixture itself is easy to ignite with a regular sparkler. After starting the reaction, the mixture glows with a highly bright flame and reaches the temperature of almost 2000 degrees Celsius because of the reduction of iron oxides by aluminum and synthesis of pure metallic iron. This reaction is one of the few reactions that boosts such a high level of energy release, because of which it can take over an hour for the mixture to cool off in the air. That's why don't try repeating such dangerous experiments unless you have taken all the necessary precautions. By the way, we can see how addition of flux caused most of the impurities to float to the surface, and there should be some iron on the bottom of the foreign protrusion, and here it is. The nugget turned out to be quite good, and it even has a shiny surface, because adding flux protected the freshly obtained metal from oxidation. By the way, these days the thermite reaction is used in welding railway tracks in order to reduce wear off of the movable parts of high speed trains. So, the first test with the thermite mixture went well, and I managed to extract iron from its oxide. I think it's time to substitute the purchased ferric oxide with this very piece of magnet from Italy and turns this heavy stone into a shiny piece of metal. But the reaction won't work with such a big nugget. We need to grind it roughly for the thermite reaction. To do that, first of all, I broke off a few pieces of stone from the larger iron ore nugget. Then these pieces need to be ground further. I'm using a do-it-yourself grinder, which I made by welding a piece of tube to a steel sheet, which I can fit with small pieces of magnetite and grind them further. Next, I can grind the magnetite gravel I have obtained in such a way into fine powder using a regular coffee grinder, which coped with the task surprisingly well. I'm sieving hard pieces of magnetite which we stood grinding in the coffee grinder with a regular sieve. I decided to use magnetic separation as a means of primary purification from gangue. Since magnetite powder gets strongly attracted to magnets, while other substances don't, you can easily separate the obtained iron ore from its impurities. As a result, I'm getting a magnetite powder with a purity of about 80%. Anyway, even iron ore nuggets of higher quality still contain some other minerals and gangue. Finally, I have all I need in order to turn iron ore into a piece of pure iron, which I can use to hammer a knife. But then I thought to myself that a knife made of pure iron won't be very practical because iron rusts. Let me better obtain stainless steel. Yes, you heard it right, you can obtain not only pure metals, but also their alloys using the thermite reaction. To do that, I just need to mix the iron oxide I extracted with oxides of other metals, for instance chromium and nickel, and I'll get grade 420 steel, which is quite suitable for making knives. First of all, I'm weighting 320 grams of my do-it-yourself magnetite powder into the stirring container, 5 grams of silicon dioxide, in order to infuse the alloy with silicon, some manganese dioxide to harden the alloy, some nickel oxide and most importantly 50 grams of chromium oxide in order to give the obtained alloy anti-corrosive properties, because it is chromium that will form an oxide film in this alloy, 
protecting the stainless steel from oxidation. To finish off, as I usual, I'm adding some aluminum powder, but still, the previous term interaction with it went too quickly. And in order to compensate for that, this time I'm adding more flux to the thermite, in order to slow down the reaction and obtain more stainless steel. At the end, I'm adding 3 grams of graphite in order to infuse carbon into the obtained alloy and in order to give it the needed hardness. After stirring, I'm igniting the thermite mixture and observing the chemical reaction of synthesizing stainless steel. Aluminium reduces all oxides in the mixture, turning it into an alloy called stainless steel. After cooling off, however, I was in for a disappointment. Seems like this time I used an excessive amount of flux and slowed down the reaction too much, which is why there wasn't enough time for the formed drops of stainless steel to bond together before hardening. That is why this time I managed to get only a few drops of stainless steel instead of a big nugget. I need to improve the mixture somehow, but first I need to grind some magnetite for the next attempt again. For my second attempt, I mixed all the components using the same ratio, but I substituted aluminum powder with less fine aluminum powder and used less flux, reducing its amount to 30% of the whole mass and stirred the mixture fruitfully. Hopefully everything will work out this time. Let's ignite it! Seems like this time the reaction went ideally well. It didn't go too fast or too slow, which is why there formed a layer of hardened slag on the surface of the alloy, which makes me hopeful that there will be a positive result. And yes, after the mixture under the hardened slag cooled off, I saw a rather even and smooth nugget of stainless steel. Of course, because of the sticking breakdown product, it didn't look so beautiful and shiny as one would expect, but still it was fine. Interestingly, some pieces of the hardened slag looked like some gemstones because of the crystals that formed inside. Well, after synthesizing stainless steel from a regular piece of iron ore, we can give this piece of metal some interesting shape, for instance, with the help of forging. But unfortunately I am not a skillful blacksmith, and I don't have a special workshop for that either. That is why I decided to ask a professional for this help with that. I went to a blacksmith from the Italian School of Professions, whose name is Edwards. This workshop has got all that's needed to turn this unremarkable piece of stainless steel into a beautifully shaped blade. First of all we decided to test how malleable my do-it-yourself stainless steel is and whether or not it contains large amount of phosphorus and sulfur, which can make this alloy too fragile. To do that, Edwards took a small piece of stainless steel, which I synthesized during my first experiment with a thermite mixture and heated it up in a gas furnace until it was red hot. To my delight, after the first hit with a hammer, the small nugget didn't crack and according to the blacksmith it forged quite easily, even though it retained some hardness and was more resistant to forging than a regular soft seal. After the first successful test, we threw my small stainless steel nugget into the furnace and after that, Edwards decisively began to forge the nugget into the needed shape with the help of a large mechanized power hammer. It would take a whole day if we did it manually, but like that this process takes a few minutes. More precise shaping needed to be done manually, which also took some time. After the forging work, what's left to do is the most boring process, which is polishing the blade sample and shaping it into the needed form. A 
as the blade was polished, it became apparent that there were some small defects on the blade because of the unusual shape of my steel nugget, but I think it won't have much of a negative effect on the performance characteristics of my knife. After rough polishing, this blade needs to be tempered, or in other words, it needs to be heated in a furnace until red hot and then immediately cooled off in oil, which will significantly increase the hardness of the material. Nevertheless, besides having hardness, this blade also needs the right tendency in order for the metal not to break when sharpened or used to cut and not to form cracks. To give it the needed properties, I am sending my blade into an oven for 2 hours at 230 degrees Celsius, so most work on the knife has been done. What's left to do is to give this blade a final polish and make the handle for it, which is something I could do quietly in my small and simple workshop. I used birch wood for making the handle, and I used a bronze pipe plug to make a blooster and a head polish it beforehand. I'm going to glue everything together with epoxy resin, which can be purchased from any hardware shop, and before it hardens, I'm aligning the blade in relation to the handle for one last time. Initially, I tried to sharpen the blade using the ancient method which involves a regular stone, but I didn't like this method, which is why I took my old and handy kitchen knife sharpener. As a result, I even managed to sharpen my knife to such an extent that it could even cut paper. It was not ideal, but it could do it anyway. For more scientific testing of my blade, I bought a special device which measures hardness of different metals. It works fairly simply. Inside there is a spring, which pushes a ball made of a hard material. It hits the metal, and the speed of it bouncing off indicates the hardness of the metal. For instance, the hardness of my knife turned out to be 219 points, according to the leap chart. Surprisingly, my do-it-yourself knife even exceeded this result. It means that my do-it-yourself stainless steel turned out to be even better than factory-made one. I'm surprised. By the way, what about the corrosion resistance of my do-it-yourself knife? For the final test, I just cut some apple and sour peach slices in order to let the acids in these two fruits try to oxidize the metal along with the oxygen from the air. But it didn't work as expected. Chromium in the alley creates a protective oxide film, which safely protects my knife from any acids. That's why, as a result, I managed to make such a good knife from a regular stone, which will proudly belong in my kitchen. This knife is even can cut paper very easily. So I think after watching this video, you'll know how to make a do-it-yourself knife from a regular stone. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting.